on June the 6th, 2012, or June the 5th, depending on which time zone you live in, there will be what is called a transit of Venus. This is a very rare event, and it is unlikely any of us will be alive to see it occur next, in 2115. The transit has historical significance, as it allows us to make a good approximation of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, just by using some basic geometry. I say basic, but there's one thing you might not know, and I'll teach it to you now. Most people measure angles by dividing the circle into 360 degrees. Obviously, this is just arbitrary. It could just as well be 300 degrees or 400 degrees and so on. We choose 360 because many other numbers can divide by it, that's all. However, when doing geometry, there's another more convenient way of defining angles. We can define one radian to be the angle when the arc cut out of a circle is the same length as the radius. The advantage of this definition is that, given any angle, we can calculate the arc length as simply the radius multiplied by the angle. For example, if the angle were two radians, then the arc length would be two times the radius. 1.3 radians makes it 1.3 times the radius, and so on. Now to the transit. When viewed from the northern hemisphere, it will appear to move across the sun's surface from west to east. For the southern hemisphere, it's the other way around. Consider the moment when the planet's edge touches the edge of the sun, just before it moves away for another 103 years. What's interesting about this moment is that it's not really a moment at all. It will occur at different times for different people. And I don't just mean different local times, of course it will depend on different time zones. I mean that even if we all synchronized our watches, we'd see it happen at different times. To show you why, here's a diagram of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. We're looking down on the North Pole. The first people to view this event will be the ones at the back of the Earth's movement around the Sun, the backseat passengers, if you will. And from the point of view of this diagram, the Earth is orbiting anti-clockwise, and therefore it'll be sunset or near sunset for these observers. The last people to see these edges touch will be those at the front of the Earth's path around the Sun, those in the driving seat. It'll be sunrise when it occurs for them, and by the time they see it, both the Earth and Venus will have moved a little in their orbits. If we have two such observers who have synchronized their clocks, we can calculate the time difference, delta t, between the two observations. Also, their two different lines of sight form a triangle. We can use this triangle and the time difference to calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun. First, let's assume that the orbital speed of each planet is constant, and that they move in perfect circles. If so, we can figure out the distance the Earth has moved in its orbit. The Earth has an angular speed of 360 degrees per year. That should be obvious, as it's the definition of a year. Well, all right, 365.25 days to include the leap year. Now in radians, 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. Look it up if you're unsure. So we can say that the angular speed of the Earth is 2 pi divided by the orbital time period, T of E. I say orbital time period because we can then talk about other planets too. If I multiply this angular speed by the time difference, I can get the angle. This is similar to multiplying a regular speed by a time to get the distance. So, we can calculate the angle the Earth has moved in its orbit. Using what I previously said about radians, we can then multiply this angle by the radius to get the arc length. For this red sector, it gives us the distance the Earth has moved in its orbit. Now the radius is what we're after, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This measurement is so important for astronomers to calculate other distances, they've given it a special name. They call it the astronomical unit or 1AU for short. Okay, now back to our triangle in black. Now we've got the distance the Earth has moved in its orbit. We know that the distance in space between the two observations is just that result added to the diameter of the Earth, since the observations occurred on opposite sides of the planet. I've called the diameter of the Earth D of E. Now there's another way to calculate this same distance. Consider the sector of Venus's orbit, this other red triangle. We can use the same derivation for the angle if we know the time period of Venus's orbit. 
If it does 2 pi radians in, say, t of v time, then we need to multiply by our time difference to get the angle it went around the sun. Now we might assume that the size of the planet and the size of the sun is very small compared to the distances from us. This seems like a good guess since Venus appears so small and if it were about the same size as us, it must be very very far away. This means we can expect only a very small error if we measure Venus's orbit from the edge of the sun instead of from the centre. So we can say that this green angle will be practically equal to the orange angle. Therefore, we can find another expression for the distance in space between the two observations. If we multiply this angle by the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 1 AU, we have found another way of calculating the same distance. Now, it's not really interesting to know what the distance in space between these two transit observations is. What's interesting is that we now have found two equal expressions that can be rearranged. I'll let you do the algebraic steps, but here's the final result. It's an equation that allows us to calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun if we know the following things. The time difference between the two observations, the orbital time periods of the Earth and Venus, and the diameter of the Earth. The first one is possible with a synchronized and reliable pair of clocks. The other pieces of data can also be calculated with some easy geometry, and I'll link to some other videos that explain this at the end. And what I've just presented is a simplification that makes some other assumptions. Firstly, it makes the assumption of a small angle, it ignores that orbits are not in the same plane, and it assumes that there are antipodes. If we add all those in, the equation gets a lot more complicated. And given that we know all these variables to a very high precision, it's interesting to reverse engineer the equation to determine the time delay. It's interesting to see that on opposite sides of the Earth, the difference is about 11 and a half minutes. So, if you're interested in astronomy, and you know someone who lives on the other side of the planet, you might like to collaborate to determine the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Thanks for watching.